This is the Brave Co. Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Valentine. Hey, Brave Co. Men. This week's episode is a teaching that I did on boundaries from a Boundaries Lab class. Honestly, it's one of my favorite teachings that I've done on boundaries, and I think that you guys are really going to love it. Honestly, this is this is uh, one of the things I've been looking forward to the most because we get asked so often, I get asked so often, you know, why are my relationships suffering? Why is my marriage hurting? Why am I having a hard time uh, at work in conflict all the time? And pro- every week I'm telling people, have you read the boundaries book? Have you taken a boundaries class? Have, how are your boundaries in life? And they're like, uh, what do you mean? What are you talking about? What kind of boundaries, you know? And, and so to me, this is really exciting because we get a chance to go deeper and, and, and be really practical. And then the cool thing for me is I love this format. So, um, because I've been a counselor for so long, the, the question answer format is so much funner for me than just preaching on a Sunday morning or something where I get to talk the whole time and everyone just sits there and listens and goes, man, I hope I remember this. So this is really fun. So as I'm talking, if I stir some stuff up in you guys, um, yeah, just jot down the uh, the question and and we'll have quite a bit of time afterwards. I'm going to talk until I get tired of talking to myself or hearing myself talk. And then uh, I'll do some Q&A and and we can do that. But um yeah, let's let's just pray and then we'll get started. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you brought us all here. God, you know what we need. And Lord, I just thank you so much that you want us to live healthy, whole, thriving lives that are full of life and full of freedom and full of joy. And Lord, you created us to to live um, inside of boundaries and inside a covenant. And, And Lord, I just ask today, God, that as we go throughout these next two days, Father, that you would put into place the key elements that have um, been missing from from so many of our lives, Lord, that you would make us uh, sharper, God, that, that you would equip us to live how you intended us to live. Amen. So today we're going to talk about God's original design and how how creation story, some of how creation story is really our story. It's God's design for how we were supposed to live in relationship and and live a perfect life. And we're going to talk about how boundaries really is all about love. Boundaries, the whole, the, the whole purpose of boundaries is so that we can love and be loved. If you can start that clock in the back so that it's counting down, it's frozen. It's timeless. When God was thinking about creation, we don't have to think about creation a lot, but when God was thinking about creation in the beginning, there was just chaos and disruption and disorder. And it's really interesting because I'll go back to this a lot, but we often don't think about the role of boundaries in beauty and boundaries in creation and boundaries as the foundation for our story. But when God was was thinking about creation, he started to think through what boundaries do I have to put in place to create beauty, to take chaos and turn it into this beautiful place that we call earth and our planet and our solar system. And 
And Genesis walks us through this beautiful story of God creating order. Now, for some of us, because of how you've grown up, the word order feels a little bit like, duh. Or impossible. You're like, "Mm, order sounds great. I don't think it could ever happen. I don't think that's possible. Yeah. What's order? I was talking to a friend yesterday. We were were having lunch. And um, he grew up in a home with a lot of siblings. And his parents were really dysfunctional. And he said "There there was no such thing as order. It was chaos all the time. And in a world like that, you know, it's hard to feel it's hard to feel cared for it's hard to feel loved it's 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 hard to feel peace it's hard, there's no way you can thrive and that's what was happening inside uh before god put order before god brought order there was just chaos we're going to read some of it in the beginning this is genesis 1 and you know that because it says in the beginning In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. It's really interesting because it wasn't like there wasn't anything. There was stuff. There was the Holy Spirit was hovering over the waters, right? But it was formless. It was empty, it was dark. <clears throat> and God said, what did he say? I told you this would be interactive. He said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that there was light, and it was good. And he separated. Here comes a big boundary, right? What did he do? What was, the, what was one of the first boundaries? Light. From darkness. And he created what? Night and day. Anybody from Alaska? Anybody spent time in the summer up in Alaska? Yeah. Without What happens? Oh, the boundary of night and day gets really small, doesn't it? And for some of us, you're like, ooh, endless adventure. Until you do it for a little bit, right? And then you're like, no sleep equals chaos. And then what's the other side of that, right? Night and day. What's the other side is in the wintertime in Alaska, what is my life? It's just formless and void all the time. There's just darkness everywhere. And you feel lost and in, in, in trapped inside of this deep darkness because there's not, there's no day. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, this is verse six, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. And God called the vault sky and there was evening and there was morning on the second day. That's such a cool story, isn't it? Because he's, he's going in and he's just, he's putting everything in its spot, in its place, giving it function. Verse nine, and God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place and let the dry ground appear. And it was so. And God called the dry ground land. Yeah, you got it. It's what you drove here on. And they gathered the waters and he called them seas and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kindness, and the trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was, it was good. And there was evening and there was morning on the third day. Verse 14, 
And God said, let there be light in the vault of the sky to separate the day from night and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give them light on the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. And he also made the stars. What was God creating? The sun and the moon. I feel like this is a story for my kids. I'm like, I'm here. What was it? It was, it's this, it's a sun. Yes, it's a sun. <clears throat> All right. Verse 20. And God said, let the water team with living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the creatures of the sea and every living thing which the water teams and moves in and about it according to their kinds. I just want to pause here for a second because that word according to their kinds makes a big difference, doesn't it? Um. How, just keep it paused in your mind. We're right there according to its kinds. Remember, uh, in school, I, I really struggled in school. Anybody else struggle in school? I'm not really allowed to tell my kids anymore how much I hated school because I did that with my first set of kids. And then my wife was like, you're just giving the permission, kids permission to hate school, you know? It's like, I just wanted to feel known. <laughs> So I have a plan to lie to my other kids now about it. One of the big challenges that I faced in school is that what was expected of me, what was required of me, and how I was designed and made was very hard. I felt like a monkey in an ocean or a fish in a tree, right? I'm a, I was a, bo- a boy full of energy and full of adventure and discovery. And I'm going to sit for eight hours a day and listen to someone talk. And it was really hard, right? It was really, really challenging for me. And I'm not saying that my parents did something wrong or it's just, and I'm not even trying to harp on our school system. I'm just saying, That model didn't fit super well for my kind. Anybody ever feel like a fish out of water or a monkey in the ocean? And you start to live life like that and you go, what is wrong? See, God's design is in his original design is that you would be placed according to how he designed and made you, that you have a certain makeup. And we know that we have a certain makeup, right? There's, there's um, a different Enneagram types. How many of you have seen the different Enneagram types? There's the different Myers-Briggs, uh, right? Some of you are, are like, I'm a INFJPRQ1. Let's see, I'm so special. I get a, a number in there. And, and you start to realize, like, I am a unique individual that is designed in a unique way that needs unique things in order to really thrive. God knew that when he created you. And he factored that into creation. And we'll talk about your creation story as we go through this. We'll, we will. We'll talk about your creation story. But a lot of us really struggle in life because, well, <clears throat> Because you weren't put in a place according to your kind. You were just put into a place and then expected to live up to the expectations without being put into a place where you could actually really thrive. That's a part of boundaries. Is God put the fish in a place that had the right ecosystem for it to thrive? That's profound. According to its kind. And God saw that it was, yeah. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in numbers and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth 
And there was evening and there was morning and the fifth day. We're really getting somewhere, you know? You guys want me to rush through this, but this is the creation story. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their... God loves order. He loves setting people up for success. He loves setting creation up for success. He didn't just put a whole bunch of fish and birds and things everywhere and said, go find your place. Just go do whatever you want. They'll figure it out. He set them all up for success. And the livestock, the creatures that moved along the ground, the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kind. Now that I say it, you see it a lot, huh? <clears throat> and it was good. God made, oh, sorry, little kind and the livestock according to their kind and all the creatures that moved along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Now, v- verse 26 of chapter one starts a whole new thing. And it's when man gets introduced into the picture. And here's what I think is so fascinating is that before man was ever introduced, God set this perfect platform up. But think about it. He didn't drop man in when it was formless and void into this space and have man endure this crazy chaotic experience. He didn't. He didn't separate uh, night from day and then put man there. Like now that you can see, just wander around. He didn't do that. He didn't create the ocean from the the land and separate it and say, okay, now just figure out what you want to do. Just have at it. God set the stage. He goes night, day, sun, moon, stars, water up top, right? Water down below. You got land. You've got the seas. You've got birds and fish and wild animals and livestock that all have this command to be fruitful and multiply, right? They've all been given instruction. This is really profound. All of life has been given order. God has set in perfect place this order. And then he comes to man. He creates man. And he puts him in a place where he can actually succeed. That's powerful. This is a powerful picture. The way that God set up the earth and set up man He set us up so that we couldn't fail. Then God said, let us make man in our image. Someone asked the other day, I saw it on a post. uh, They said, why did God say let us? Because God is a triune being, right? The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He wasn't talking to himself. He was, okay, here we go. Um, then, then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the living creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image and in the image of God, he created him both. What? What is a woman? We don't have to go there right now. That's probably a different teaching, isn't it? But it is also a boundaries teaching, isn't it? In the image of God, he created them, both male and female. God blessed them and said to them, every man in this room should know that because you are trying to fulfill that and you're telling your wife, we have to, this is God's command. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. I just want you to to understand what's happening. 
God set it up, right? We all we already know that. He set up this perfect place for us. He's created order out of chaos. He creates man. He doesn't randomly create man. He creates man in what? In his image, in his likeness, right? He creates man in his image, in his likeness. And then he doesn't just put him on the earth to go, go have fun. He gives him direct instruction. He says, go do this. Here is your job. Here is your task. Here is what you're going to do on the earth. This, this Adam, this is what, this is what you're going to spend your time doing. That's incredibly important because again, how many of you in life have felt like you're wandering at different seasons in your life? What am I doing? What was life supposed to be like? Again, the creation story is supposed to be your creation story. We're gonna, again, we're going to talk about what your creation story was like a little bit. But God is continuing to lay out for man what it is that's expected of him. But you have to remember that what he's expecting him to do, he also created him to do. He's not giving him something that he can't actually accomplish. He's not even giving something to him that he doesn't want to accomplish. Anybody ever see God as this God that's going to give me and ask me to do things that I don't want to do? That's a, that's a, a wrong view of God, isn't it? But he goes, no, oh, Adam, I've set you up to rule, to reign, to, 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 to be a, a creator, to be an imparter. And we're going to see that in a minute. He continues on, verse 29. Then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit in it and seed in it. This will be yours for food. And all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath and life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw that he had made, oh, sorry, God saw that all he had made was, was very good. It wasn't just good. It was very good. And there was evening and there was morning and the sixth. And now we're going to chapter two. Thus the heavens and the earth were complete in all their vast array. And by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had done, he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he worked more because he was an American. And he's trying to get ahead, right? And he realizes there might be a recession. Oh, what did the creator of time, the creator of space, the creator of energy and effort, what did he do? Holy smokes. You mean he he worked six days and then thought, you know what? I deserve a break. Isn't it amazing how God doesn't ask us to do something that he's not doing? What a good example. You think about it. He's the guy that created energy, yeah? He's the guy that created how it all works. I propose that he didn't have to rest if he didn't want to. Anybody grow up in a home where your parents asked you to do a whole bunch of stuff they weren't willing to do? You don't have a God that's like that. Your God isn't like that. All right. Adam and Eve. Um, I'll speed up a little bit. It says, uh, verse seven talks about, uh, the Lord formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed life into him. 
Now, the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in the Eden, in Eden. Again, here's what I want you to think about. God's setting Adam and Eve up for success. Did Adam go plant the garden? God planted the garden. This is so cool, huh? This is what your parents are supposed to do for you. Just by the way, when we talk about your your origin story, you are supposed to be set up for success. This is our model. The Lord God planted trees in the garden, and there he put man that he had formed. Then Then the Lord God made all kinds of trees growing out of the ground, the trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the very edge corner of the garden was a tree of life of the knowledge of good and evil. No, I lied. It says in the very middle of the garden, right? God put the tree of knowledge of life and good and evil. Uh, I'm fast forwarding. Okay, here we go. Verse 15. I just saved you from a bunch of rivers and stuff. The Lord God took man and he put him in the garden of Eden to work and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat any tree in the garden, but you not, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now then the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and the birds of the sky, and he brought them to man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was his name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, which thanks to Bob Dylan, we can now sing that song. Man gave names to all the animals. Anybody know that song from Bob Dylan? I know you think that I'm off track. I'm not off track. You just don't know the track. That's what's happening right now. If you knew it, you'd be really pumped up about that. That's when Bob Dylan got saved. But again, uh, Adam couldn't find, there was no suitable helper. So God uh, caused man to fall asleep and out of his rib, women, you're welcome. And man, thank you so much, God. A woman was formed, right? In Genesis chapter three, we all know what's coming because we've been in children's church long enough. Genesis chapter three, God sets Adam and Eve up for success, doesn't he? He's, he puts them in this wonderful place. Man, I would like to have property in the Garden of Eden. Would have been awesome. You see, God is coming in there and he's walking in the cool of the day with Adam. And uh, and they're just enjoying time together. But God's already told Adam, he hadn't told Eve, but he told Adam, hey, Adam. You're not allowed to eat that tree right there. That tree right there in the middle of the garden, you're not allowed to eat that. You can eat everything else. You can eat that antelope or the gazelle or the red deer, the Trianosaurus rex. You can eat whatever you want, but you can't have that tree. And we know what happens. We we know that Eve um, gets enticed and she eats the the tree, the knowledge of good and evil. In What's really interesting to me, this is so interesting because if I was God, which thank God I'm, thank God I'm not God, because this would be a very self-serving world just so that we're all clear. But if I was God, I would have, I would have put the tree in the garden, you know, because God was right in doing that. If you don't have the opportunity If you only have one choice, you don't really have a choice, right? If it's just you on the earth and there's one other person, right? If it's just me and there's one other person on the earth and I'm stuck and I'm on a little tiny island, it's like, well, who am I going to choose? All right, you know, I guess. There there had to be some choice, right? God knew there had to be some choice way for you to choose whether or not you are going to serve me, whether or not you are going to love me, because love is a choice. Love's not a feeling. Someone just went, wait a minute. Love's not a feeling. It's not. You can't fall out of love in marriage. You don't trip and fall into marriage, right? Some of you may feel like you were seduced into marriage, but it was still a choice. 
You don't fall into love and you don't fall out of love. So God knows this and he knows there's got to be a choice. And he didn't, what I love about God is he's so secure in his, in the power of love that he made that choice really beautiful, really tempting, really appealing. I would have made it a stinky little thorn bush. Smells like farts. And I'd have put it in the back corner on top of Mount Sinai. That would have been the choice. And I would have said, they have a choice. If you don't want to love me, like I did, would do with my kids, right? Like, oh, if you don't want to eat this dinner, then you can eat acorns outside. As if I'm making my kids powerful. Some of you, that were your choices growing up, right? Like, you can eat this or you can go to bed right now. You're like, it's 8 a.m., <laughs> It's a long, I'm going to be in bed a long time. I think I'll eat that. That's what I would have done. And of course, Adam and Eve eat of the fruit. And that's the first time that they start to, that their eyes are opened up to good and evil, right? See, it's really interesting. Like God gives Adam all this responsibility, all these instructions and he gives them these, this, this command. Don't eat that. You're not allowed to partake of that. But he's not doing it because he doesn't want them to have good things. He's actually telling them that because he wants them to only have good things. I'm trying to save you from shame. I'm trying to save you from pain. I'm trying to save you from discomfort. I'm trying to save you from chaos. I'm trying to save you from chaos. He spent all this time creating order. And he goes, that right there, that's going to create chaos in your life. The day that you eat that, you're going to start to recognize chaos. Oh my gosh, we're naked. Oh my gosh. I feel shame. I need to hide. I got to run away. I'm, I feel fear. Chaos. You understand, like, when God set up the foundations of the earth and, and put us on here, he created boundaries. I'm just really trying to drive this home. He created these boundaries so that there would be divine order in your life. So that there would be an ecosystem of order. And when we break boundaries, when we break God's boundaries, it's not that, oh, we're going to hell. It's like, I don't serve God so that I won't go to hell. Like, that's a bonus. But the, the, what really happens is when I break God's divine order, the way that he has set up the foundations of the earth to operate, I end up living in chaos. That's what happens. That's ultimately what happens. See, God set up structure in order so that we could live in in perfect love with him. This is really important. <clears throat> Let's talk about the sexual revolution. I'm gonna, I mean, we're going to start getting really practical because it's just been really theoretical. Although that wasn't theory. That just really happened. In the 1970s, well, 1960s, actually, maybe we start in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. What is, what, society was, uh, the divorce rate was very low. Marriages were not just common, but marriage was uh, n- normal in in. smiled upon by society. But what started happening in in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and 50s is 
that homes were really strict, right? Like religion was just so strict. Everything was so strict. If you remember, like your great grandma probably got dressed in the closet or in her bathroom and mom and dad probably didn't sleep in the same bed. How many of you, you had family like that? Yeah. He grew up with lots of rules, lots of regulations, lots of, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? This is interactive. So you guys can throw out stuff too. What's that? Yeah, not just structure, but uh, I think legalism. Yeah, and you know what? People, when you grow up in a, in a culture of legalism, pretty soon you go like, "Well, I don't want this." Anybody grow up in a legalistic culture? You're like, "You're streaming." My pastor's watching. I don't want to raise my hand. It starts to feel like, "Well, this doesn't feel like freedom. This doesn't feel." accepting. This doesn't feel like love. This doesn't feel like peace. This feels like chaos. It's a different kind of hell, isn't it? Because you're all, you're really all alone. It's all about the rules and the regulations and what you can't do and what you're not going to do. And there's so much isolation and loneliness inside of that. It really is. You have things that you can't talk about. We can't talk about sex. Dad can't even talk about sex. Dad can't even look at mom. That, that's, that's the culture that was happening. Well, people start to go, no way. I'm not doing that. I'm not, I don't want a marriage like my parents' marriage. I don't want my, I don't want to marry someone and friggin' have to, have to uh, sleep in separate beds. And not only that, but I mean, it goes even further. Like when the, when the dad got home, the whole home was structured around the dad. Right. Dad had come home and it's all about serving the dad. And uh, listen, I'm all about serving and I'm all about respect and I'm all about honor, but that's supposed to come from the head down, right? That's supposed to come. My kids are supposed to respect me and love me because what? I first love them and I respect them. I'm going to work and I'm working hard and mom respects me. How hard is it to respect a man who's laying down his life for you? That's the context for it. And it that it was all flipped upside down, right? So it was all geared towards don't disrupt your dad. Don't make your dad, he's tired. You know, when he gets home, we, he's going to be the one that eats first. And that's just, and I'm not saying every home was like, was like that, but the culture was like that. And people started to go, no way. I don't want to do that. I'm not doing this. So you have this revolution. And you have thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people starting to gather in these different places like Woodstock. And what's happening is they're going, we, they're revolting against this strict legalistic life that they grew up in. And women are starting to burn their bras, right? That's kind of a waste of money. By the way, you're going to have to go buy those again at some point. Or there's long-term consequences for not. I just like to get really practical as the counselor. So women are burning their bras and, and men are, are whatever, burning their underwear. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> they weren't even wearing underwear already. And they begin to what? They begin to like free love was, was the, the mantra of that era is love should be free. It sounds awesome, doesn't it? Love should be available to everyone. Everyone should feel loved. If you want to feel loved by me, come and feel loved. Well, free love has real consequences, doesn't it? What's the consequences of free love? Abortion. Single parenting. Fatherlessness. Addiction. Incarceration. You're like, well, you jumped really far. <laughs> Sex, love, and rock and roll was the recipe for free love, right? No boundaries, no limits, freedom. We're all going to share what we have. We're going to live in a commune. We're going to share what we have. But what happens when you get a woman pregnant outside of commitment, outside of covenant? Well, for starters, what's the incentive to not get a woman pregnant? 
I want, I want indulgence without any, uh, commitment, responsibility, consequences. How many of you would love indulgence without consequences? All of us would. Listen, what that gives you the option to do is eat all the ice cream you want without getting having the effects. Yeah? Yeah. We all want that. Yes. We pretend to ourselves that we live a life like that. But our bodies show us differently. There are consequences for our actions. Some of you are having a 60s revolution in your body. Free love. Eat that and that and that and that. Again, it sounds really good. It preached really good. It looked really good. It's the same movement that's happening now. It's just, it's just morphed a little bit. Is you should, you should follow your feelings, follow your emotions. You should be whoever you want to be. Love yourself the way that you are. What does all that create? It created chaos. You know who it created chaos for? It created chaos for you. See, somebody's, somebody's idea of a boundaryless life, it always makes the next generation pay. It does. That's what happens, right? Is Adam and Eve's poor choice, who would that, who was that ultimately passed on to? Their kids, wasn't it? Cain and Abel and all of us. And because of this idea of no boundaries, right? Of following your emotions, following your passions, getting what you really want. We now have a higher divorce rate than we've ever had. We have 49% of all kids born in America today are born in a fatherless home. The incarceration rate is crazy. The abortion rate, you start to look at, well, where did abortion start to skyrocket? When people started getting pregnant outside of any commitment, any covenant, any any order, it's chaos. So now you have to justify your actions, don't you? You have to go, well, this isn't really a baby. And I'm not preaching an abortion message. I'm preaching chaos. We have to change our belief systems when we live in chaos. I have to convince myself that disorder is order. That disruption is structure. That my life and my way is the only way that really matters. I can be anything or anyone or look any way I want. But what is that coming out of? It's coming out of chaos. It's coming out of destruction. See, love without limits is not love at all. It's disorder. This is really important because this is your foundation for boundaries. This is your foundation for setting limits. This is the foundation for creating order in your life. If you're not careful, you'll end up back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s where because you feel chaos, you create legalism. But society has gone the complete other way and went, we don't want legalism. What we want is freedom. It's like, no, you just traded one hell for another. That's what's happened. And we do that all the time in our lives, don't we? We go, I don't, I don't want legalism. I want freedom. So I'm going to let people do whatever they want to do. I'm going to give my time freely. Well, it won't be long before you hate people. Because if you give an inch, they'll take a mile, especially an undefined inch. They don't feel thankful for the inch. They feel entitled to the inch. And then you think that it's their problem. It's not their problem. It's your problem. We're going. It's the story of Israel, right? <clears throat> Israel's in bondage for 400 years. Is that right? 400 years. They're in bondage. 
And God sends a deliverer. He sends Moses. We're going to do this fairly quick. God sends Moses the deliverer. And we all know the story, right? Moses has a showdown with Pharaoh. Pharaoh finally lets his people go. The people uh, leave. They flee Egypt. It's the big exodus. And there's so many different miracles that happen inside of their story, isn't it? They go, they get, uh, Moses parts the Red Sea. They go across the Red Sea, right? On dry land. That's the important thing. How many of you would like to be there that day? I would still be fishing. I would. Carl knows it. I'd be in there casting away. Land them right in the middle of the They wander around for 40 years. What's well, supposed to take a 40-day journey. They wander around. God shows up to them in a cloud by night. Sorry. Fire by night and a cloud by day. He gives them manna, which is heaven food, and quail to eat. He makes their clothes not wear out. That's really phenomenal what's happening, isn't it? It's really, really profound when you start to to think about it. And then God establishes his covenant with them. Moses is at, at Mount Sinai. Do you guys remember this? Moses is at Mount Sinai and Moses goes up to, to meet with God. And what does God give Moses? The commandments. Is God trying to create legalism with his people? What's he, where is he taking his people out of? Chaos. And what's he trying to bring them into? Order. But see, they don't trust anyone, do they? This is really important. The Israelites don't trust God. So while Moses is up getting the commandments, they're down there making what? An idol. Make us a God that we can feel, that's tangible, that we can serve. And Moses, you know the story. He comes down, he goes, son of a brick. And he breaks the tablets on the ground. And God goes, I am done with these people. How many of you like to watch that show? Moses. God goes, no, these are stiff necked people. As if God didn't know that. Moses, I'm not going with you. I'll send my angel. This is an amazing story. Because you see the exchange of relationship. You also see Moses have needs and set some boundaries. He goes, God, if you're not going, I ain't going. I'm not going. If you're not going, I'm not going. God changes his mind. They get all the way to the promised land, right? And we know the story. I I told you I'd speed up, but I'm just not going any faster. They get all the way to the promised land because God is bringing them to a place of promise. And what did God set up for them? God had in mind for them this incredible place of promise. That's where he's bringing them. And take you out of chaos, I'm going to put you in order. That's the whole journey, out of chaos, into order. That's your journey, out of chaos, into order. We fight that journey. That's I'm giving you the punchline while we're in the middle so you can put the pieces together. They get all the way to the promised land, right? And of course, we all know that, that they don't, 10 out of the 12 spies don't want to go and they don't want to go because it seems scary. There's big giants in there that are going to kill us. We were like grasshoppers in their eyes, which is like, did you talk to the giants? Did you ask them, hey, what do I look like to you? And he goes, a grasshopper. No, that's what happens to us when we start to encounter real powerful living. There are real giants in the land. 
there's there are real things that you're going to have to conquer. The promised land, the, uh, let me give you a verse to help establish this. Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He what? Makes me lie down. Green pastures. He what? Leads me besides still waters. He restores my soul. Okay. Pause right here. Person that was in chaos. Yes. Yes. Person's in chaos. God takes that person and he brings them to a place of peace and order. Yeah. Okay. Now let's continue on. How does it go? He leads me down the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And then it says, here we go. Though I'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Okay, pause. This is wild, isn't it? When you start to look at this verse that we read all the time, it seems so backwards. Because again, if I'm God, I go, Phew, you've been in chaos for a long time. I'm going to I'm going to order you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to lay you down by the stream. I'm going to give you peace. I'm going to lay you down in the pastures that are quiet. I'm going to give you rest. When we get up from here, go live in the pasture of peace. Don't go to chaos anymore. Don't go to disorder. Don't go to disruption anymore. That's why we had to lay you down in the pasture of peace in the first place. That's what I would do. That's not what he does. He gets the order. He gets you to a place where you're restored in your trust for him. In restored back into relationship with him. And when you're in, when you're restored into relationship with God and you trust him, now walking through the valley of the shadow of death feels like the pasture of peace. Because there's no fear there. Take that, go back to the Israelites. What's God trying to do for 40 years? He's trying to drive out the fear so that he can lead them into a place of promise. But I didn't come up with this phrase. The Israelites left Egypt, but the Egypt didn't leave the Israelites. They were slaves. They are 400 years of thinking like a slave. I'm going to get wrecked. I'm going to get pillaged. I have to fight for myself. I have to fend for myself. These rules and regulations aren't going to help me. This is not what I need. I need a living God right here, right now. I can't rest unless I'm in control of all this stuff. If we go over there, there's giants. They're going to crush us and kill us because that's what's been happening to me my whole entire life. They don't trust. So they don't get in. A whole generation has to die and a new generation is born. And the new generation wasn't, didn't have that old, what is it? Trauma. They didn't have the trauma. Why is that important? This is crazy important. Why do we violate? Why are we living in pain? We're living in pain because we don't have good boundaries with our thought life. That was the Israelites' downfall, right? We're like grasshoppers in their eyes. No boundaries. No boundaries to go, that's a lie. That's not true. That's my old life. What I'm telling myself right now is coming from my past. So we've had a hard time in relationships because you got hurt in relationship. And we keep mirroring the past over our present and future. Well, that, that's trauma. Oh, what does God want to do with you? He wants to put you and he wants to address your trauma. He wants to heal your trauma so he can put you back in because your promised land doesn't lie in the safety of perfect, peaceful streams and rivers. And, and, and it doesn't. Your promised land lies in the valley of the shadow of death. 
because you are called salt and light. You're a preservative. You are a light on a hill. You're the hope. But if we don't ever address those places in our life, the wounds, the trauma, the terror, our past life, you're bringing Egypt into your Christian experience. And so anytime you feel new rules, anytime you hear a new command, you're listening to it through that, through that old lens. Hey, Brave Co. Men, hopefully you love this week's episode. Listen, if you have not subscribed to our podcast, you are already behind. Go ahead and click right here to subscribe to our podcast. And if you have not watched last week's episode, you can click right here and watch last week's episode. And listen, if you want to upgrade your wardrobe, you can check out some of our new hats that we have in stock and all our other swag. Go to braveco.org and you can look at our store there. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.